It's 10 o'clock. How, how long am I supposed to go? 10 more minutes? Maybe I should take some questions. Should, yeah. Um, what, what's your opinion of the Illuminati? Oh, that's a whole other big subject. I, I, I couldn't even start to talk about that. Do you think these men in black have anything to do with the Illuminati? Well, we don't know if the Illuminati really exist. It's one of those great, strong legends throughout, throughout history. You know, uh, Robert Anton Wilson has written a lot of books about the Illuminati and elaborated on it. And, but I, uh, it would take me another two hours to talk about the Illuminati. I, uh, I personally don't think they exist, but there are a lot of people who do think they exist and that they're the cause of all our troubles. This would be a group of uh, men who are uh, illuminated and who uh, control everything on this planet. The gentleman back there, yeah? Yeah. The what? Approach me? No, but I've approached them. I've chased them. I've, I've missed them by 10 minutes. Uh, I was When I was in West Virginia and Ohio, people would call me up in my hotel and they'd say, hey, these guys are here. And uh, come and come and get them, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I'd race there, and uh, they'd, they'd be gone by 10 minutes. And uh, we had the local police in a lot of towns looking for them. We, we had, at one time, I had hopes that we would catch one of these fellows and solve a part of that mystery. Somebody asked me about Maury Island? Yes, I did. Uh-huh. Well, Mo Maury Island, uh, the report of men That was considered the first men in black case and it, it turned out th that's a very involved thing because I spent a lot of time on that Maury Island case. Um, this is where a group of men were on a boat in Tacoma Harbor, and they saw a couple of objects fly over the boat. This is in 1947. And early the next morning, a black car pulled up in front of the home of one of the witnesses, and a man got out and invited the witness to, to breakfast. And over breakfast, he warned him not to talk about what he had seen the day before. This was before he told anybody. So uh, this became one of our first men in black cases. But when you r really dig into that, it seems to have uh, an explanation. At that time, that area, uh, the Hanford Works is very close to that, where we make atom bombs. And there was a, a big thing going on with the uh, spies. And uh, uh, later, of course, we had sensational spy trials about the atom bomb where uh, 65 of the uh, scientists who were making the atom bomb were proved to be traitors, and they had been giving the Soviet Union materials. And this was all tied in with that. And, it, and so a lot of the stuff that was going on in, in Maury Island that didn't make sense at that time later makes sense in the context of the spy chases that were going on and all. And uh, the, the, the original story where this, these objects were flying over to Coma Harbor, uh, this story has a certain flaws to it, that, namely that the one of the men who uh, gave, made the most noise about it proved to be a tremendous liar, and uh, it's a very involved and complex case. I have enough material to do a book on it, and nobody wanted to do the book. They said, that's 1947, forget about it. Yeah, but uh, it, it was not uh, one of our true men in black cases. Well, no, the only, the only photograph is uh, Tim Beckley and his friends uh, t took a photograph some years ago in New Jersey. There, there was a black Cadillac that parked across from uh, the home of a UFO investigator, and this man would get out of the black Cadillac and stand around and, and look at the house. And uh, so uh, Jim Mosley and uh, Tim Beckley and some others, maybe they'll tell you about it later, they went out there with cameras and they, they went chasing after this uh, Cadillac. Uh, my theory is that it was somebody's chauffeur, and, yeah. Well, there, there, are, there are a couple of cases where they seem to, to be machine-like, like they, they run down like a clock. Uh, they'll talk for, with a witness for half an hour, and they just run down. And then they'll, then they'll leave the house and uh, say the, the witness lives way out in the country somewhere, and they leave the house, 
and they disappear and the witness looks out the window and there's no car out there, nothing for them, no transportation for them. They just walk down the road. Another thing that happens in more than one case is it can be raining and miserable and these people will arrive at the door and they're dry and their their feet aren't muddy or anything. And uh, this, uh, yes, sir. Uh, How much uh, No, not much, but we'll we'll start hearing some stuff now. Do you think there's a lot of this change on UFO sites between our government and the Soviet Union? No, but I think the Russians are way ahead of us in it. Uh, the Russians have, uh, in the last couple of years, have had some big UFO conventions, and the, the speeches and the papers that they've delivered show that they've been paying attention to it for a long time. And while uh, American ufologists have been bogged down with Roswell and uh, MJ-12 and all that stuff, the Russians have really been studying the UFOs themselves, and they, they have a lot of interesting ideas. And uh, now that uh, everything has opened up, we're going to learn a lot from them, I think. Yes? Uh, uh, not, uh, we've had a lot of cases where they've threatened people. But, and and there, were, there are cases where they have bragged about killing people. There was a famous case where they bragged about killing uh, Barney Hill, uh, bragged to a doctor about that. But uh, we don't have any direct evidence that that's happened. But there have been a lot of mysterious deaths in the UFO field. And from now on, you can watch for this. Uh, a lot of the leading UFO investigators have died on June 24th. Um, in fact, even Jackie Gleason, who was a big UFO buff, he built a house up in the Catskills that looked like a UFO. When you drove by it, you'd, you'd swear a UFO had landed, and it was Jackie Gleason's home. But well, he died on June 24th, uh, two years ago. But there are many others who died. Uh, Frank uh, Edwards, who uh, you've all read his books probably, Frank Edwards died on June 23rd. Of course, June 24th is the date that Kenneth Arnold saw the sighting, had the sightings in uh, 1947. Well, thank you very much. I think. Uh... No, I don't have any. Chris Cooper Ryder is pregnant and needs a snowmobile ride to nearby Interstate 75. From there, she can be transported to the hospital in Bowling Green. So my husband went over and asked the neighbor to radio for help. That anyone that had a sled, you know, if they could bring it out. Right after that, he comes back over, and this, this guy comes up. He was uh, dressed all in black, black snowmobile, and he had a black sled on the back. So he got us all bundled in and everything, and everything was fine. And uh, we went to Signet, and Signet had an ambulance waiting for us. So they were trying to get me in the ambulance, and I'm all worried because I had taken a quilt, and I wanted to make sure I had this quilt. And so I'm getting the quilt in the ambulance, and all of a sudden we decide we need to thank this guy that that got us there, and he was gone. And so we asked the emergency squad to thank him when they saw him again, and they go, we thought you knew him. And we're going, no, we thought he was part of the emergency squad because he came right after we radioed. And they said, oh, well, it must be somebody that heard your CB announcement that you needed help and showed up. Well, later on, my husband had gone to the neighbors to thank him for radioing, and the neighbors said, I couldn't get the CB radio to work. So we still have no clue who this guy in black was. Um, but uh, the emergency squad didn't seem to know either, so it was kind of a, a mystery. <laughs>